Okay, good afternoon ladies and gents. Thank you for coming to this session um, on building enterprise blockchains. So we're going to be talking about the AWS blockchain and ledger technologies. So it's not all about managed blockchain, uh, it's actually including some other information as well. Uh, but rest assured this session is mostly about the Amazon managed blockchain. So before I continue, I'd just like to apologise for my voice. It actually went completely at the weekend, it's just about come back, so I hope I can last the next 50 minutes or so and keep going to the very end. Uh, so if I cough and drink water, I, I do apologise, but uh, it's the only way to keep going. So what do, actually, what do you actually think about blockchain? What does the market actually say about it? So here's some good examples we see from the press quite frequently. Um, apparently, it's the solution to absolutely everything. It's a panacea to the whole world's problems and every potential use case, every genre you can think of, is going to solve the problems. Potentially. It does suffer, unfortunately, from a little bit of hype effect, shall we say. Um, it suffers from the Bitcoin effect as well. So a lot of people think when there's issues with Bitcoins or Bitcoin exchanges, that reflects badly on the blockchain algorithm. But it's nothing a bit further from the actual truth. Um, and there's also not that many actual use cases out there that people will actually talk about with blockchain right now. So hopefully by the end of the session, we'll actually give through one or two use cases that actually work, one or two sort of more details of one, of one particular banking organization, what they're doing, and you'll see how powerful and how useful this could actually be. So why do we actually need anything like blockchain? So the first customer need that we actually have is where there's a significant number of customers want a type of system of record, shall we say, also known as a ledger, that's actually owned by a single trusted entity. So this ledger serves, hopefully, as the transparent, immutable, and most importantly, the most verifiable record for a number of parties working together as some sort of central entity. This is what they really actually want to do. So a good example of this really comes from supply chain. This is what gets used quite a lot, and um, the traditional farm to fork type of exercise that some supermarkets do these days. It's where the, the organizations in that chain, they actually want to have complete transparency and real-time information about absolutely every change or every action taken against that item from basically from cradle to grave, all the way from leaving the, leaving the suppliers, leaving the manufacturers, all the way to the supermarkets, into the customer's hands, and all the way home. So this makes communicating between those entities much easier. Uh, it makes <coughs> coordinating and dissecting issues, again, much easier and much simpler. But building such a system is actually quite complex. It's quite difficult to actually do this sort of thing at scale. <clears throat> and and also this, the, the issue as well, that a lot of, a lot of these organisations have, shall we say, data hygiene issues. And the one organisation doesn't quite trust another organisation's data, it's not quite complete, they don't have the same sort of things that everyone else needs. So there's that sort of mutual distrust as well. Uh, but there's other examples of too, when people want, want to use these things, other use cases such as healthcare use cases, HR, payroll, things like DVLA for vehicle records, that kind of thing. They're all good examples of where you, you just need to know what happened to a particular thing from the beginning, of the beginning of its life all the way through to the very end. So it's worth <coughs> realising that people face quite a lot of challenges actually building out some sort of centralised ledger or building some sort of system of record. It is actually quite difficult. So a lot of our customers today, they, they try and set up a database initially, sorry, a, a ledger system using a relational database because it's what they have, it's what they're used to, it's what they actually understand. Um, but relational databases aren't really built to be all these things that blockchain should be. They're not immutable, they're not cryptographically verifiable. Um, I mean, customers, customers try to recreate this functionality by using, using things like audit trails, audit tables, that kind of thing, but it's hard. It's complex. Most importantly, it's quite expensive to actually build this, and even worse, from an operational point of view, it's really hard to actually maintain that kind of environment. And also, there's no way at all that you can actually tell from a database engineer who has full system access, and let's be fair, they need full system access to manage the system. You cannot actually tell if they've actually changed the data. You can tell, of course, by audit shows that it got changed. You can tell if actions get, sorry, if alerts get actioned by your operation system that, yes, this thing has been changed. But just by looking at the actual data you read off the database, you have no idea this has changed. So when you read the data, you treat it with the trust that you give it, and you think this is good, this is real, this is live, but it was changed last week, just nobody knew, no one told you. So in that case, it's not the best kind of system. So, some customers try to solve this really by trying to build out their own blockchain, quite simply. They build their own framework to try and solve this particular use case. And it seems like a good idea at the time. But blockchain networks, they're actually for a different use case. They're not really for um, essential, uh, sorry, a single database that you want to manage internally. They've got a different purpose. They're really there for the decentralized use case, where you have multiple third parties talking to the same application stack, multiple parties connecting, uh, multiple members cooperating within one particular environment. So you need at least two organizations, you need two peers within the environment in order to make it actually work. 
So you have organizations building these frameworks, building up blockchain, and they build almost like fake peers, fake members in the organization just to try and make it work. So again, they have more organization, more configuration, more maintenance to make this actually work, and it just becomes a bit painful. <clears throat> The first service we actually want to talk about today, briefly, is the Amazon Quantum Ledger database. So this is commonly known as just QLDB internally. So this is a fully managed, important point, is a fully managed ledger database that provides immutable and verifiable transaction log owned by a central trusted authority. So note the immutability and verifiability are really key points for QLDB. If it didn't do them, we wouldn't use it, you wouldn't use it. There'd be no reason to actually use it, but because it's, all the data within it is totally immutable. You can verify its history from again start to finish. It's actually quite powerful. And the quantum aspects of it, of course, doesn't come from quantum physics whatsoever. This actually comes from um, excuse me, an internal ledger database we actually use internally at AWS. So it's actually built on tried and trusted technology whose full purpose in life is to have this immutable ledger of um, actions and operations on an entity, which we've used internally for quite some time. And the quantum name just stuck. So QODB it is. But before I talk about anything else, shameless plug, next door at 5 past 3, one of my colleagues from Chicago, Michael Labib, is talking primarily about QODB. So at the end of this talk, if you think that's probably more suitable to your use case, if a centralized ledger sounds actually what you need rather than this decentralized blockchain, um, then pop next door to Theatre 5, talk to Michael, and uh, see what he can tell you about QODB in a lot more detail. And that's the end of the shameless plug. <clears throat> So and this, the things on the screen now, this is the, the main reason we actually launched QODB. So the ledger database, it's completely verifiable history of all app changes, which is absolutely great. It gives you immutability. So all changes are actually put into an append-only journal. It cannot be changed, it cannot be deleted. Once it's in that journal, it's in for life. It's not going anywhere. The data itself is actually hash-chained <coughs> as well, much like a traditional blockchain um, set of records. So again, it's very verifiable. But because you have that entire chain in, in that, ha in, you have the entire hash chain, sorry, the data history itself is transparent. You can query it on it. You can find out what has happened to it over time, nice and simply. You can analyze that lineage of that particular data and see what went on in its life. And you can trust the answers you get back from that are actually going to be an accurate representation of what happened to that data. It's also really fast. It scales up with your application. So the more requests you throw through it, of course, you're going to get low, very low latency results coming back. And you don't have to worry about scaling the underlying database technology to suit your application needs. It will just do it essentially by itself. And of course, it's easy to use. Because to use it via its APIs, you're using SQL, which hopefully everyone here knows how to actually code. So using SQL APIs to get into this um, database model makes it really, really simple. And more to the point, it's also serverless, so it can't really get much simpler than that, we hope. So <clears throat> why do you want to use decentralized trust? Why, why isn't centralized um, single entity trust what you need? Well, there's a couple of reasons. So the second is, is customers who want peers or, or consortiums to work together and execute applications that share, data, well, that share data together through some sort of central authority. It's important to share an example here because this is where most customers and most people actually get lost on blockchain because they can't see the use case. They can't see why we would share information. Why do we actually have to do this? Why can't I just host a database and let the third parties call me? What's wrong with that? Unfortunately, as one of the use cases later says, quite a lot is wrong with that. It doesn't quite work out in practice. So as an example, if you're trading goods, say, across international borders, you're required to work with many organizations. So you're going to have importers, exporters, multiple banks, multiple shipping companies, insurance companies. There's lots of different organizations trying to get involved. And to have a single actual central authority would just be difficult to do. Um, and also, these people don't really trust each other either, so they'd rather do something the old-fashioned way. So their old-fashioned method is quite good. They will actually send trade-related paperwork, such as letters of credit and such like to do with trade import, trade export. They'll send it to each other physically. And this could take five to 10 days for the actual transaction to get approved and actually done, which is just ludicrous. So what they want to do, these consortiums want to actually trade with decentralized trust. They just want to have some way of saying, I picked up this item, I picked up this shipment, and I've done my thing to it. I've, I've insured it, I've put it into a ship, I've taken it off the ship, here's a bit of lading, here's a letter of credit. I've just done my thing, and let's, let's that, let that thing carry on its natural life. So that's what they're trying to actually do. They don't want to have to, excuse me, they don't want to have to go through a single central point. They just want to have some central system or decentralized system where they can just say, this is what's happened. Um, and the system should hopefully carry on. And then when the information goes into the system, every participant in the chain, every consortium member gets a copy of that ledger information so everyone knows in this chain, that is, sorry, everyone who's involved with the chain knows exactly what's happened to everything at every point in time. There are no secrets, which is quite a good thing. 
There's other examples of this, of course. We have things like mortgages and lenders, supply chain businesses, retailers. They, they all like this sort of idea as well, in general principle. But there are some problems with this sort of complex business network, unfortunately. So many existing networks rely on central authorities. These are often quite inefficient, they're expensive, they require time consuming maintenance, so people just don't like them. Um, consortiums often can't, <laughs> they will get a much better outcome if they actually shared information properly, but often they can't agree how to actually share the information safely, securely, what to actually share and when. Getting an agreement between, between that many companies is hard. And multiple organizations, they, because they really need to get a single view to get an accurate picture of what's actually going on. Um, and if you get, one, you get into another business's network, it's actually quite hard. But after all, if I said, can I use your network for your business purposes, you'd say, yes, come on in. If I said, no, you use mine, you'll say, no, I don't trust you. And that's just what life is like out there in business land. So again, asset transfers, they often happen. Um, they go through sort of inefficient and very expensive scroll processes. So again, we like to sort of make that much, much faster, much simpler. And this, your sort of public networks have to have some way of maintaining a tamper-proof history of transactions um, and also maintain a global state. And that's really easier said than done. So what blockchain does, it tries to build trust in the network itself and tries to eliminate the central authority or even the need for a central authority in that particular business network. There's three main components to it. The first one really is the distributed ledger. This is the thing that actually holds a list of transactions, what's happened to your entities, your artifacts, whatever it is you're trying to actually track and trace. Um, that sits in there and that's shared across all the third parties inside the, um, the actual blockchain. There's a consensus mechanism. This is where all the members of the um, blockchain network itself have a way of deciding whether to allow a new transaction in or not. And the third thing is a smart contract. The smart contract execution environment is where you write your own code to, just, to let the peer nodes decide, will I let this transaction in or not? Do I trust it or not? You're going to have your own business rules to decide what goes in and what doesn't go in. And between these three things, you basically get a system that will provide you with immutability of resources or artifacts and changes, and also, hopefully, trust. Without trust, not much happens. Now, hopefully most of you probably know this already, um, but quickly how blockchain actually works. So a block is usually mined somehow by following some complex math um, mathematical problem. So Bitcoin is a great example. Um, the first company who, mines a, who actually solves a problem gets to claim the fee or the, or the bounty for actually mining that block. But what actually happens when they write the block into the chain, when it gets written into the ledger, it also writes in a link or a copy of the hash of the previous block. So block 59, as you can see, the second thing down, it knows the hash of block 58. Great, it's in the ledger, everyone's got a copy, let's carry on. So when you start mining block 59, it carries on doing that. When it's been found and, and discovered and written into the ledger, it also includes a copy of the hash of block 59. And when you do block 61, the same thing happens. So every block knows about the hash characteristics of the previous block, so the chain is there. Now, the blockchain systems, obviously, there's no function to say, please change my data. It just doesn't happen. But let's say somehow someone actually could change the underlying um, information on the system. What would actually happen? Well, first, the transaction would change within the block, nice and simple. The hash of that block would therefore change because the transaction has changed, so the hash must change. And instantly, we, the, the blockchain system should point out that block 60 doesn't know about block 59 anymore. It has lost it. It has disappeared. It knows nothing about it any longer. So the blockchain mechanism will now basically, well, ignore those blocks. Everything from that change block onwards is no longer in the chain, it's basically discarded, it is destroyed. So you cannot change items of data in the blockchain and actually keep the chain intact. In other words, you can't do it and hope nobody notices, because that isn't going to be the case. So the consensus mechanism, um, there are many different ways of actually doing this. The Bitcoin ones are the obvious example, and it's called proof of work. Someone does a very large computational problem, first person to finish, they get to actually win the right to, to write in the new blockchain record, and they get the bounty, they get the fees for doing it. That's great. But there's two or three other ones as well that get used quite a lot. One is about having a distributed set of validation systems or other validation peers, um, and they sort of propose and vote on what the next block ought to be. It's one method. There's proof of authority, another one where you actually have third parties who have gained some sort of reputational trust within the blockchain network and they have more rights, shall we say, to write the block than others. That's one thing. Of course, they have to maintain their authority, maintain their trust. That's, again, easier said than done. And there's some other ones as well. But essentially, the different blockchain systems, different blockchain algorithms will have different ways of actually doing it. <clears throat> the important thing here really is smart contracts. So this is the actual be-all and end-all of what goes into my chain. This is where the decisions actually get made. Now, traditionally, contracts are usually made by human beings. 
um, and or to be involved or really are they involve human actions and most things go wrong in life when humans are actually involved unfortunately so when a smart contract actually gets triggered and a smart contract happens um, it happens automatically because something's come into the chain so Someone's asked to write data into it, the smart contract kicks off, looks at the data, performs any rules you happen to have written in your own code, and it says yeah or nay. Nice and simple. But because it's code, it's programmatic, it's going to do the same thing every time. The rules are static, or they can change over time, but the rule for that execution is fixed, you know exactly what it's going to do. It's going to be consistent today, tomorrow, against every blockchain item written in that day, which is great. So basically, if something happens in the blockchain system, you know exactly what's going to happen in terms of does it get approved or not. It's basically if, if this, then that, at its simplest actual form. And again, those contracts are open to manipulation if you're based on humans, because people can change contracts um, or try and break the contract. And then the only thing you've got to do, your only recourse um, as a person is to, well, try and actually sue those people who try and broken the contract. Uh, but the smart contract, you can't actually do that because you can't change it, you can't break it. Once it's written into the ledger, it's written into the ledger. The contract has done its job, the results are written out, and you cannot change those results. So smart contracts are absolutely key, and you'll spend a lot of time working with blockchain, actually de devising and working at what your smart contract should actually do, what your rule should be, and what you're actually trying to achieve. So, challenges with existing blockchain systems. The main problem really we found in this is the actual database itself. Um, despite the impact well, it has in the organization because you've got to build it, buy it, license it, maintain it, operate it, scale it, etc. Um, that's a lot of time and work and money anyway. But it's really around the, the way they actually work. It's, it's around the fact that they rely on doing inserts, updates and deletes. That's really what they do. That's a raison d'etre. They've got no record of the history of what was there before. Um, so of course, but the, the requirements of having that audit rule still exist. Therefore, developers in their cunning ways, they'll go and design systems such as audit tables, um, audit trails, tombstoning, call it what you will, of some way of saying, I know what was there before this change happened, so we're going to track it ourselves. But of course, you're doing that inside the IDB system, and it's just more things you have to build, configure, manage and maintain. You probably shouldn't have, have to actually do. So it's also resource intensive. As the blockchain gets bigger, as you're more and more successful, the database might have to scale. You might have to scale the IOPS, scale the storage, scale the CPUs, build a bigger cluster, and make the database bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes on. And that's, that's difficult. I'm sure you've all tried it on-premise or in the cloud. Um, it's not the most straightforward thing to actually do. Performance can be problematic as well, um, especially trying to actually persist your blockchain rights in some sort of sensible linear order in the tables you write them into. That can be difficult. It just takes more time. So why do it? It's going to be error prone because a lot of customers, when they build their own system using databases, they'll put the smart code contract stuff in as store procedures, triggers, something like that, to have things happen when the database gets triggered. But usually lots of folk have access to these things, lots of people can change them, things can go wrong, code can be just, just be error prone, um, and it can just break quite horribly. And worst of all, it's the fact you've got sysadmin or root is still there, they can still change anything they want to, and hopefully no one will ever know. So again, just by basing it on the database makes it an unpleasant um, thing to try and build and manage. So, the whole point of this is the Amazon Managed Blockchain, the idea is it's going to solve most of these problems for our customers. We're going to build you a decentralized um, blockchain system. It's going to be fully managed and there's going to be virtually no heavy lifting whatsoever other than a few clicks and having to define yourself who your members of your blockchain actually are. That's the plan. It was announced at reInvent end of last year, and the best thing about it recently is last week we actually made it GA. It actually got released on the 30th of April, so it's now there, it's now live, and can now actually be used. Now, it was first released uh, to support Hyperledger Fabric, uh, one of the most popular ones we've got out there. Uh, Ethereum is coming quite soon. It's in the console already, it's just greyed out, so that will be here pretty shortly. Um, but the first release is also only available in US East, only in the North Virginia region. Again, it's on the roadmap, plans to actually roll out to other regions, so it will come. So this is definitely the very first release just last week, and it will go globally over the course of time. And to use it, again, like most of our services, there's no sign-ups, there's nothing to actually join. It's just go to the blockchain page and click Create Network. And within two minutes, you will have a single peer network. It's really that simple to now do. So we're going to try and show how e easy it is to actually get started, um, what it is actually trying to give you as a managed service, um, and hopefully show you why it's a good thing to do, he says. The first thing about it is it is actually fully managed. There is nothing to do. There's nothing to scale, nothing to build. You specify the size of the instance nodes you want for your peer nodes. That's about it. There's nothing else to actually do. Um, so there's no hard to provision, no configuring of software, networking, security, etc. Uh, you just don't see any of that at all. It's all taken care of by the managed service. 
The second thing is actually quite key. Um, we're getting a lot of questions on this at reInvent last year of is it going to be an AWS specific or Amazon um, defined protocol? No. We are supporting two of the most common open source frameworks out there in Ethereum and Hyper Ledger Fabric. That's what customers are using mostly right now um, for the blockchain solutions either with us or on premise. So that's the ones we're going to support. Simple as that. Why reinvent a blockchain technology that actually works really well for customers now? It's fully decentralized, as you'd expect. There's some diagrams on this in a bit to make it a bit more sensible. Uh, it's very reliable because it uses QODB and KMS under the hood for its own reliability and its own security. So we're using our own tooling to actually make this more secure. So there's nothing there for you to actually build or manage in that sense. Um, it's pretty low cost and you're only paying for what you actually use. So as you add more peers to your network, the cost will go up because you're adding more peers. As they drop off, the costs go down. It's simple as that. I'll show you the pricing in a slide or two, but it's very straightforward. And as it's integrated as well with the rest of the AWS environment, or your AWS VPCs, etc., you can use anything you like on the back of this. So if you want to actually have um, copies of, say, all your network traffic, all your network activity, going into another QDB database somewhere else to analyze later for trends and stuff, you can. There's nothing stopping you doing that. So how it works. The console walkthrough was actually quite simple. Go into the console, um, pick your open source framework they want to actually use, um, and set up a new blockchain network and add a member in about three clicks, I think maybe four clicks, and you are done. The network is basically created. You then invite other AWS accounts to actually join you, and when they agree, they basically create their own additional members in the account. Is, sorry, they, they create their own additional members, so you now have two organizations, three, four, ten, in your actual network. So you just invite the accounts, and in they come. Um, you then create the actual peer nodes themselves, the actual compute units you need inside the network for each of those members, and they run the actual blockchain, <coughs> excuse me, peer software, and they also keep track of the local copy of the ledger. And then you create and deploy your own chain code, your own smart code, and your own decentralized applications onto the peer nodes. And that's it. You're done. The whole thing gets built, and the whole thing works. But why do we choose um, Hyperledger Fabric? Uh, a lot of enterprises actually use this already. It's, it's one of the most stable ones actually out there in the market anyway, so it's a good one to choose. And it's also a permissioned network, meaning there is no public access. There's another myth that people have about blockchain. It is all public, public, public. No, it's not. You can have perfectly good private blockchains as well which is what enterprises usually actually want for their own internal organizations. But why is Fabric, we think, quite a good system? It's got something called channels, which we absolutely love. So rather than having a single ledger that everyone shares, you can actually create private channels between two organizations, org A and org B. And they can create a private channel, and they essentially get their own private sub-ledger with transactions between themselves on it. And no one else in the entire blockchain network can see them. Organizations C and D can't see them. But B can have a channel with D. And then A, B, and C, D could all share the big common channel. So you can basically create the super or uber um, ledger that everyone can actually see or have private communication channels between certain aspects of your network if you want. And that's a really powerful thing to do as your, your consortia numbers grow over time. The chain code is written in Go, uh, so general purpose language. More languages are going to be coming soon as part of the Hyperledger projects. Um, and when you actually run your smart code, they're just run in spawned off Docker containers on the peer nodes. It's nothing particularly clever in that sense. That's just how Hyperledger likes working. So they're all working in small container, run your code, and that's all there is to do. Validation. Um, it's down to you, really, to define what your sort of consensus and validation system is actually going to be. You can have it that every single peer must approve this change. You can have it that any peer who approves it in five minutes after it gets submitted can approve this change. You can have it so that no one approves the change, and it just goes in automatically. But please, don't do that. But you could. It's entirely down to you what it is, because you're writing the code, you're, you're writing the chain code, you decide what goes in, why it goes in, and when. And the last thing, it doesn't need a cryptocurrency. Please feel free to create one if you want to. Most enterprises really don't want to do this. There's absolutely no point. The purpose is you could create in Hyperledger currency or some sort of cryptocurrency you give to other members for doing some work. But actually, all the consortia in this blockchain should be getting value from being in this blockchain because you've created it for a perfectly good business purpose. They're all using it, they're all taking advantage of it, so they're getting benefit anyway. So it's actually in their interest to make sure the chain code rules and consensus mechanisms stay up to date, stay current, stay changed, etc., and make sure it's good for them. There's no need to give them a 1,000th piece of a random cryptocurrency you've just invented. It doesn't really matter to them. Public, public um, blockchains, yes, more of an issue, but private, there is just no need, so you don't have to do it. Now, Ethereum, it's one of the others we're actually using, so I won't say much about this in detail, just what the differences really are. The first one, it has its own language called Solidity for the, the actual blockchain stuff, which is fine. Um, 
you can actually also have a public network if you want, as well as a private network. So Ethereum has got a public one. If you want to put your blockchain on there, you can. But equally, you can keep it private in Ethereum too, if that's what you want to do. Uh, one big thing, it doesn't even have the channels concept, so when you create your ledger, everyone in that network can see everything in the ledger. Now that's usually the point of blockchain, but there's no then option for having sort of sub-networks built up between, or sub-channels between organizations. It's all or nothing in that sense. So, this does come up quite a lot. Who actually owns the network in a blockchain? As you'll see from the architecture diagram in a few minutes, um, really, no one. It's a decentralized resource. It does not really belong to anybody in the actual membership, in the, in the consortia list who's actually members of it. Um, every single peer in it has an equal sh share of the ownership rights, etc. They've got an equal share of writing the contract code, they've got an equal share of designing the, co the consensus mechanism. They're all in it together. Now, you could decide through your own means to say, let's have one member have a bit more rights than others. That's, again, entirely down to you guys to decide to do that or not. But um, I could set up a blockchain network, invite a dozen of you into my network, and then leave. And it doesn't matter at all. The blockchain network continues because it still has members. As long as it has members, the AWS managed service will keep going and keep supporting those members in that blockchain. I, I may be long gone, but it doesn't really matter. As long as the members exist, the blockchain exists. Who pays? This question comes up again a lot for new services. It's really important to note that everyone pays for their own resources. So there's a membership fee for each peer, to, sorry, for each member to be actually in the blockchain itself. So that kind of takes care of the resources we use, what, that we deploy on your behalf. And then you pay for your peer nodes because you specify the size. You pay for data transfer because it's your data transfer in the network. And, and you also pay for things such as VPC endpoints, which you can create into your own VPCs to let your client apps call your blockchain. So you pay for all of those things. So if there's 10 members here in the same blockchain and you're all building the same sort of environments out, you're all, making the same, you're all, you're all incurring the same rough charges but the person who pressed the create button on the network isn't. It's only the people who use the, the actual network, use the framework, who have the peers, et cetera, that actually incur those charges. Now, it comes in two versions, or two um, pricing versions at, at launch. So there's no upfront commitment, just log onto the console, click create, and off you go. So what we actually do is, depending on which edition you pick, and there's two of them, um, they each have different, different pricing structures. So the difference is really quite clear. The standard edition can have more members. The standard edition can have more peer nodes, much more powerful peer node compute instance sizes as well, um, and much higher throughput ordering servers that we actually manage for you behind the scenes. The starter edition, they're much lower numbers. But when you're doing a dev environment, actually, you wouldn't go outside the starter solution anyway. There's no real need. You only need basically two or three members anyway. It's enough to prove your chain code works. It's enough to prove your algorithms work. It's enough to prove the network's going to work. Once that's done, well, if you're staying within just three or four members, then why not stay there? At least you've got a reason to get a bigger instance, um, stay in that environment. Don't go to standard edition unless you need to. But if you've got 10, 12, or in this case up to 14 members um, trying to join the same network, and then the standard edition is the only way to do it. Pricing really works out, it's all on the website as usual, but if you had a starter edition, um, a starter version of this and you had two members, and they ran T3 small nodes, and they had two of them each, they had 20 gig of storage per node, they wrote in nine megabytes of data per hour, the whole network would cost 67 and a half cents per hour. And that's, that's all it would be. Go up to the standard edition and the charge per member kind of actually changes. So if you're a member and you had a pair of M5 2X large nodes, 500 gigs of storage, you wrote in 100 meg per hour, it would cost you $1.93 an hour for that member to belong in as part of the blockchain. Um, so it's really straightforward. It's simply a case of the membership fee, the number of nodes, the size of the nodes, and the data you write. Very, very simple calculation. But how does it actually work? What actually is Hyperledger Fabric? So the actual flow, as you can see on screen, um, what starts off as a client node on the left-hand side, it sends a transaction proposal to the endorsing nodes to say, I've got this new thing I want to write in. I've got blockchain number 66. I want to write it into the system, and this is why. So all of the endorsers, so basically all the peers in this network, in this case, um, they simulate the transaction. They try and make sure the transaction is actually correct in the first place, and they generate some form of endorsement signature to say, I'm good with this, or, they say I'm not. And, and that then goes back in step three, back to the client node. It collects all the responses. It thinks, well, I'm good to go. I'm going to package up all those responses, pass them off to the, the central ordering service, and then it decides what to do. It verifies the signatures. Um, it makes sure that they actually meet all the policies. It makes sure they've got the right number of endorsers. It makes sure um, any other rules you've got in place, such as 
are not going to approve the request 50 minutes after it was made. There's no point. It's too late. It's too old. So we're just not going to let that one in the system. So all those roads are down to you. And if the endorser says, great, or the ordering service says, great, let's do it, it then broadcasts a message to all the peer nodes to say, this is the next update to your ledger, please write it. And they will then all go back and update their version of the ledger or their copy um, and make it unique or make it uh, duplicate across the entire system. Now, the simulation part does get some people sometimes because every single peer node should have the same copy of the ledger. So if they all simulated the actual transaction, they wouldn't get a different result. Well, they shouldn't get a different result. But let's just do it anyway, just to make sure that you don't get a different result. So any sort of test you want to do, let's just do it just because we, we feel slightly insecure if you don't do it. We just want to try and make sure everything's absolutely right. And although a transaction, if it's unsuccessful, doesn't make it into the ledger, it should make it into the actual um, logs in the history of the blockchain anyway. So you will see these requests come into the system. You can put them out to a registry of database, analyze them later at your ledger and realize things have gone on. People have tried to put things in that they shouldn't have tried. But we don't just use hybrid fabric out of the box. We have made one or two changes. Our two main ones just worth talking of. The first is the ordering service, which is key to the whole thing because that decides what goes in and what doesn't go in. That's actually part of the foundational um, service. You don't ever really see it. You don't interact with it as such. You don't configure it. It just gets built by us to handle a sort of throughput rate based on starter or standard edition. Apologies for the noise. Um, so we actually do that ourselves. So you don't have to build it, you don't have to maintain it, you don't have to deploy sort of complex Kafka structures to make sure data gets sent around the entire environment at a good rate. Um, you just don't have to do it. So under the hood, we're going to use QLDB anyway, because why wouldn't you? It works really well for this, this particular use case. And uh, we made the ordering, ordering service something you just no longer have to worry about. The second thing is really about security. So most, most open source implementations do use soft HSMs or something equivalent for doing security and encryption. Uh, so instead, we plug in the obvious service. We plug in KMS. So that's going to take care of all things like encryption at rest um, across the estate. And one aspect of Hyperledger Fabric is that you can actually have something called a Fabric CA or Certificate Authority, where you actually inject in your own certificates. And then Fabric will actually make sure they're applied against the traffic for your particular nodes. And that works really well. So using KMS for that does actually make the thing a lot more secure and works really well. So this is slightly more detail on the uh, channel aspect. So this shows two, um, well, three members, one and two in the, on that have one shared channel one, and members two and three have shared channel number two. And it just shows quite clearly that they have got their own private ledger that they're sharing between themselves, rather than having the one large giant ledger that everyone has to work on. Now, there also is a super ledger for everyone to use, but for this example, we're just going to show the ones that uh, those particular channels actually have. The channels are not an AWS thing, they're actually part of the Hyperledger specification. So they're defined through files called config.tx files, which are basically text-based configuration files. And if you look at the Hyperledger site, it explains exactly what to do with them, how to fill them in, and on our documentation site for managed blockchain, we tell you what the values on our side should actually be. So it's quite easy to configure, but we haven't actually changed that mechanism for configuring channels. It's using what Hyperledger currently actually does. And hopefully a simpler figure for the endorsement. Um, so when the member, node, the member node at the bottom has got this request for transactions, passes them off to the, the peer nodes to validate, it picks up the responses, sends it up the middle to the ordering service, which decides if it's good or not, passes the response back to the peers, and they write it out to the local ledger. Easy, he says. Now, this is what you actually see as part of the architecture. Now, there's some things missing from this that you might not really notice. So, as in the idea of a, a VPC that this all gets deployed into. So the whole thing, the managed blockchain is, de is deployed in the region that you actually choose. The ordering service is actually at the top, so that's done and run by us. And as each member is added, resources get created um, by the servers, essentially, um, that have the peer nodes in and the fabric CA, if you actually want to have one, and they get dropped in there. Now, if you have your own VPC and you want to create a VPC endpoint uh, back into the service, then you actually can. Now, the way this works, because we're going to have millions of blockchain networks across the, board, across the globe in the next couple of months, how it actually works is every single network behind the scenes will actually create its own private VPC service name. So essentially, if you have an account that is a member of this blockchain, then when you go to the VPC link configuration screens, you will see this as a service name. It will be available to you to link to. If you're not one of those accounts, you don't have access to that service name, so you can't connect to it. So it basically creates a, almost a pseudo service on the fly behind the scenes that private link can just find, but only if you're a member of the network. So again, that makes the, um, 
the connectivity from your clients, your different um, organizations in the consortia, from their VPCs to the network, is really simple because it's just VPC private link connection and nothing else. There's no other egress and ingress controls, there's no whitelisting of IPs, there's no traffic going out to the internet or back in again. All of that just goes away, it's just private link, which makes it hopefully understandable, safe and secure. So one or two use cases we have to go through in the next 10 minutes. So customers are working on pretty much everything you see on the screen. There isn't really a segment or market sector that can't benefit from blockchain. And we have got customers looking at all of these at this particular point. So let's quickly look at the su supply chain. Um, I thought I did mention, I think, this earlier on. So the supply chain example, if you're going from the, the right-hand side to the left-hand side, if you're going from the original manufacturer to um, suppliers to shipping companies back to, to third parties, you want to make sure that you've got some way of having a, a blockchain that's recording things that are going from right to left. So I have a scenario in retail. Um, this is one of the ones that blockchain actually thrives on, <clears throat> of actually getting information about everything goes into creating a food item from the very, very first farm until it gets to the fridge in the shop and you actually buy it. So let's look at cheese, because I, I like cheese. It's always a good example. So at this consortium, we would have the farm who actually grows the feed. And in that, they would log what the actual items they're growing actually are, what pesticides are used against them, what, what um, fertilizers, etc., and they make sure that's all logged against every crop they actually harvest. Then that gets sent to the farms that have the dairy cows on. They'll have their own membership of the same blockchain. They'll record everything that happens to all the cows, what inoculations they've had, what feed they've had from which farms. That then goes on to the milk tank and transport company who take the milk to, to, for processing. It goes to the processing company that does pasteurization. That's the first step. Then goes to the processing company who does the actual uh, manufacturing of the cheese. And then the packaging company. And then the distribution company. And then the retail outlet itself. So all of those um, different actors are members of the actual consortia. And they put in the same records against the same item from Cradle to Grave. So if anything happened with the pesticide on the farm right at the very start, or something happened with the actual milk container transporting from the farms to the manufacturers, or a new strain was found of let's say a bacteria was found in the cheese manufacturing process, you can instantly decide or instantly realize on the blockchain who did that actually go to, who has it touched, which shops has it made it into, how can I get it back from those customers. And it doesn't matter where in the blockchain it actually happens, you can trace it from the blade of grass that the cow ate to the last person to touch it coming out of the, sh the store warehouse in the, in the supermarket. It's all there in the chain. So blockchain and financial services is actually quite a powerful one. Um, <clears throat> Now, of course, after this session, you actually the slides will be available at some point. So three things to look at here in this slide, because it's too big otherwise, is to do with value. Moving value, lending value, or just insuring value. They both are quite worth calling out. So if you can actually transfer values in either large amounts or small amounts, and you can do it without an intermediary, you can transfer money around the world really, really fast. Reduce the cost and reduce the time to actually move those assets around. So that's a good use case for blockchain and financial services. Another one, if you can issue debt and trade debt and settle debt directly on the blockchain, you basically you're increasing efficiency massively because you're doing everything through some sort of decentralized ledger. You're not going out to third parties for authentication or things like that. You can do it straight away, straight in the blockchain and get it done. So you increase efficiency and you actually you improve your systemic risk because there's less things to go wrong. There's less outside influences on your blockchain. And again, managing insurance value as well. That's another one. If you have some sort of reputational system to enable insurers to sort of estimate um, the risk better, then again, their lives become better. And the decentralized network actually works well for that. So we just get some Guardian, uh, which you might get to read fairly fast. Um, they saw the benefit of blockchain early on. They were building this themselves anyway. And they were interested in decentralization, immutability, transparency, etc. all the things blockchain does well. But they clearly found the process of building and main managing and maintaining these networks actually quite difficult. So what they find now with Amazon My um, Blockchain, they can deploy um, high fiber fabric networks with ease without worrying about managing the actual underlying infrastructure. What was important to them is their ghost code, their chain code, their smart contract code. That's what's actually quite key, not the rest of it. So to have an Amazon My Blockchain um, for them is just a win-win because they can have all the blockchain code they want, written the way they want it, but they don't actually have to build a thing. So as far as they're concerned, it was one of those situations, you would, why would you not use this if you're already interested in using blockchain and fabric? Singapore Exchange are quite a, quite a good example for this. Um, so they're quite a diversified exchange group. So they run quite a few key market infrastructures across the globe, including the Singapore Stock Exchange and a bunch of pan-Asian derivative markets. Uh, they're global, sorry, they're around the entire globe, but they have got a good London presence. And what they were finding with blockchain use cases is banks just didn't trust another organization for resiliency. They wouldn't trust me and I wouldn't trust them uh, to make sure that the system we're sharing was up. We'd all insist on doing it ourselves because no one 
wanted to put the business on the line through someone else's DevOps team. My own team, that's absolutely fine, but I wouldn't trust anybody else's. That's just not worth it from risk, a risk point of view from banks. They also found that they had a lot of inefficient processes for sending stuff backwards and forwards through emails and physical, physical letters. Um, all these extra hops just caused delays in anything happening. And because every third party was slightly different, having lots of different APIs to basically do the same thing just made, made their lives an absolute nightmare. So what they found with blockchain instead is they <clears throat> They implemented a distributed ledger. They loved the fact that the contracts were in place so they could write the smart logic to go between different phases of a project. They could define the rights and obligations of all the parties in the actual blockchain quite easily. And they could bring consistency and basic co coherence to the network because it was always in a stable state. And if it's always in a stable state, that means compliance are happy. And if you're a bank and compliance is happy, everyone's actually happy. And also, they already built some stuff on AWS already. So as far as they're concerned, the fact that the Amazon Managed Blockchain was also running on AWS made their life a lot simpler. And they can now add members to, the, to their consortium and take them out again almost at will um, and make much more efficient transactions of uh, things across the world. So quickly how this works. So they have two blockchains, essentially. The middle one, for one particular phase that they're working on, uh, that represents sort of sell-aside assets, say, like Singaporean government securities, as an example. And the little right-hand rectangle that is in red that has got no detail in, um, let's just say, excuse me, <coughs> that's the sort of buyer side of this, that's, that's the funds you're actually trying to buy. Say, central bank, digital currencies, that kind of stuff. So what they actually had was, they decided to have multiple blockchains for multiple purposes, depending on what the use case actually was, depending on what part of the transaction you're working in, we wanted a whole different blockchain system. So they built an arbitrator system at the top, which connected to them all. So as one blockchain worked out what to do with one particular aspect of a transaction to completely fulfill one large, long, complex um, piece of logic, the arbitrator would pick it up and essentially start the process going to inject it into the other one or get it used by the other one. So rather than just having one and making it very, very complex, they actually had five, essentially, subchains for this particular project and made the arbitrator take care of everything going between the two. And a big knock-on effect they actually had of the arbitrator, um, essentially, was they had one single place to actually go and look at um, if they had any issues with what was going on. So it was actually useful after the fact to say what actually happened, was there any problems, what went wrong? And they could use the arbitrator to actually prove what went where. The blockchains themselves were absolutely fine, but they were using that to actually try a more bigger picture, holistic view of what's going on in the world. So just for the summary. So why would you actually choose one blockchain service over the other? Um, hopefully it's fairly simple, and again, if QODB sounds more like what you need to do, just go next door and see Michael for the next session, you'll go through it in more detail. So basically, QODB is owned by a single trusted entity, one, one authority, and that's it. The Allen to Manage blockchain instead is owned by multiple parties. Although when I said owned, I mean it's actually used by multiple parties because, in essence, no one really owns it. So if you're happy with that, blockchain might be the right way to go. If you want single trust entity, essentially, because you just want a ledger, QODB is it. So QODB is also meant to provide you with a centralized, immutable transaction log. That's really what it's for. Whereas Manage Blockchain is actually designed for multiple parties using the same data. So the whole purpose of blockchain is you are sharing. You are sharing the data, you're sharing essentially the smart contracts with others. You're not keeping it all to yourself because that's not the use case. If that is the use case, use QODB. And again, QODB is actually a database. Um, the DB kind of implies that at the end. So in theory, it's quite fast. And the fact you don't have to get consent from any third parties before writing things into the ledger, QODB just does it off its own back because that's what it's trying to do. Um, it can be really, really quick if that's all you want to do. But managed blockchain, it's actually decentralized. So well, if there will be some time lag between things getting approved for consensus and passed down from the ordering service back to the peer nodes, back to the ledgers, it does take a small amount of time. Um, it's going to be so, so much faster than having any third party authorities you have to reach out to to get authentication. Everything just happens in the blockchain and that's it. In last one, so blockchain, building block solutions for blockchain, if you actually use the blockchain solution itself, Amazon Managed Blockchain, rather than QODB, then you basically have access to everything else that AWS have. So if you want to have analytics, if you want to stream data out of, out of blockchain into Redshift for analysis, feel free. If you want to attach SNS notifications and Lambda functions because something has happened in my blockchain network, again, feel free. If you want to use IoT and send in device information across your estate and put that into an immutable chain as well, you absolutely can, no reason why not. If you need Cloud HSM, why not? You can use that rather than KMS, that, again, that's not a problem. And again, link an API and Gateway to have sort of an outside endpoint service to go straight into, Q into the blockchain if you wanted to over VPC link, why not? You can. They're all possible. So we've got a number of customers at launch as of last week uh, that are using this. As you can see, some of those names like GA Aviation, Verizon, Philips, they're not small customers and they're not necessarily newfangled upstarts who are trying to disrupt the market. 
So they're definitely there to show that there's definitely problems in the world that can be solved by blockchain. And some of these large enterprises globally are grabbing it with both hands and just going off and building things. So last phase to go and use it, it's just to say, go to the console, click the button to create a network and give it a minute or two and you are done. And that's all you need to know, I hope. So thank you very much for your time. End of the session. So just remind you all, if you complete the session survey at the end, that would be appreciated.